Welcome to the second bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant. If you're here, you probably know me as Tess. In his eternal torment, it's also Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? And dear listener, um, I consider the paywall to be like the Berlin Wall, and you're on the (laughs) cool side of it. You're on the east. (laughs) Hmm. We've talked about probability a whole bunch on the pod so far. Today, we're going to talk about the actual justification for using it as a model for observations, given that, at a large scale, the physical world is pretty deterministic. So to do that, we need to introduce two different sorts of system dynamics, which means how a system behaves over time. The first is a probabilistic or random system, and the second is a chaotic one. So notice that I'm already distinguishing these two. And uh, part of that is mathematicians do. We have a very specific meaning for what chaotic behavior is as opposed to random behavior. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm hoping it will uh, either prove or disprove the seminal folk punk lyric. I don't believe in God, but I'm also not an atheist because (laughs) the universe is chaos and chaos plays favorites. (laughs) I love it. So in a probabilistic system... When a change occurs, you have some number of possible states that it can end up in. If it's just one state, then it's not really probabilistic, so we usually think about two or more. You can have a finite number of states, like there may be five options that you could pull out, like five different brands of phone or whatever, or an infinite number. The states may have the same probability of occurring. Think a fair coin or a fair die, like your favorite 1d20, which probably doesn't actually give you more crit hits or crit fails. Or a different probabilities with some outcomes more likely than others. The probabilistic aspect is that which outcome happens is not deterministic. What I mean by that is, well, you have a probability, you're not certain of the outcome, and Importantly, if you start in one state, let's say we start in state A, at one point when we're at state A, we might change to state B. But if we come back to state A, because it's not a deterministic system, we might have some other outcome, say C, if we go through it again. This is quite distinct from a deterministic system hence not deterministic, because if you have the same state at any given point in time in a purely deterministic system, the next one should be the same every time. That's what it means to be deterministic. The same starting point gives you the same conclusion. Oh, so it's not even like a deck of cards or something like that, which has different outcomes as you go on. It's more that it will go from like one state to the other necessarily. A deterministic system does, yeah. Uh, yes. Part of the trickiness is knowing enough about the deterministic system to know what the state starting state is and what governs the dynamics. So we're going to talk about that when we go to our... For some reason, my page down button is not working, so I have to scroll like a peasant. <laughs> so a chaotic system for a mathematician is purely deterministic. You can have mixtures of systems at the moment. We're just going to deal with a deterministic but chaotic system. So when you have a fixed starting point, you will always have the same outcome every time. If you restart the system in a slightly different place, you may not have the same outcome as the first one. In fact, what defines the chaotic behavior is that small differences in your starting position will eventually produce radically different end results. How long that divergence takes depends on the system. And there are a couple of other features Uh, if you're dealing with it mathematically, but that's the important one. We call this sensitivity to initial conditions. And it means basically that if you have a small change at the start, you have big changes later on. Let's draw a picture to help. So let's say we have three starting points here. We've got a blue one, we've got our red starting point, and we've got our black starting point. These are slightly different. They're relatively close together, but they are separate. And... If you are dealing with a chaotic system, we'll start with the black one. Your black one, imagine, like, time is basically how long it takes me to draw this. Goes up a bit to start with, then comes over here and does some stuff over in this side of the page. Maybe it spirals in on a point there. Your red one starts similarly, but it goes up here and has an attractor up here. So attractor being a point which, like, attracts. And then you wind up like spinning around it or something. 
And this blue one, let's say it starts here, goes up a little way, and then comes out to another point over here and spirals in on it. So we have here three relatively similar points that could be close together, but stuff it, and three radically different outcomes. Like, assuming that these are attractors where these wind up, they're never going to converge again. Yeah. If you're dealing with a physical system that is chaotic, you actually need perfect information at its state at a given point in order to predict that long-term behavior. So yeah. if you imagine that our, our true initial position is this red one here, right? Then if we make a measurement, because of measurement error or whatever, we measured this blue one, then there's only so far we can predict before they really start to diverge and you get radically different behavior. What would a practical example of this be? We'll get to that in a second, but weather prediction is one. Ah, right. Yeah. So for a stretch, we can make reasonable predictions if we know what the dynamics governing the system are, but eventually we expect them to diverge. Now, we can probably make additional measurements. So if we start here, we've measured this point, this blue point, and we predict along and along and along, and then here we make another measurement, and because our true value would be here at that point, we'd probably measure something closer to this, right? But as we get further and further along, let's say we measure again here. If our prediction is still over on this blue line, we go, hmm, that's diverging. We need to reset our starting point to something in the vicinity of this. So maybe right. we wind up with another starting point like here, and then we see what it does, right, further up or whatever. Yeah. So once again, once we make a new measurement, we can again reset our, uh, simu our, our model and see where it goes from there and have some period of reasonable prediction. So as I said, this is basically how weather prediction works. Weather is phenomenally chaotic, but we don't really have any evidence that it's actually random. Our imprecise measurements of the state of the weather system, which the weather system, part of the reason it's so hard to do this is that the state of the weather system basically means the state of the entire atmosphere, the state of the oceans, the state of like ground cover and moisture in soil and trees and all the rest of it, and the state of the sun. We do not have the ability to measure all of that at once. And what we can measure already gives us so complex a model and so much information that it will take supercomputers a while to compute any models with it. Yeah. So the huge models that we use for weather dynamics give us pretty good predictions for a day or two, okay predictions for up to about five days out. Uh, you can get a little further than that, but the uh, error mark didn't get quite large. Beyond that, the system diverges too fast. This is also where that metaphor of a butterfly flapping its wings and causing a cyclone or tornado, whatever, that's where this comes from. But I'm going to be a relentless pedant and say that that misrepresents the situation. For one thing, it implies some agency in the butterfly. We have no evidence that agency or free will actually exists. Sorry. Uh, particularly in like butterflies, we don't necessarily know that they have agency or free will, or even the illusion thereof. But you could just as easily pin the blame on all of the string of causality that leads to the butterfly, right? Because every one of those events also has to happen in order for the butterfly to be there. Yeah. And because, as I just mentioned, the state of the weather system is way bigger than that single point. It is the totality of that state which leads to the conditions that give you the cyclone. One butterfly may be a critical component in that if that was changed, the cyclone wouldn't happen, but it's not going to be the only one. There's going to be so much else going on which could also change that eventual outcome. We just have to use really simplified models, and that's one example of that because it gives you that idea of that sensitivity to initial conditions. Butterfly flapping its wings or not is a pretty small change. And then the big outcome at the end, the big divergence, is that some huge storm does or does not happen. So it's like the episode of The Simpsons where Homer goes back in time and steps on a bug and then comes back to his own time and everything is completely science fiction and weird. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I have never really seen the symptoms, the symptoms, the Simpsons. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you got to at least watch the Treehouse of Horror ones where they did all like Twilight, Twilight Zone episodes and stuff. I, uh, so I distinctly <laughs> remember the only Simpsons episodes I ever watched were like some DVD Halloween special thing on a scout camp when I was about 13. 
Yeah. Because, like, it was just, oh, my God, what do we do with these kids? We'll stick out a room, put a TV in front of them with the Simpsons on it. Sure, that's a couple of hours, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> As you do with kids. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to talk about in this are, like, really simplified chaotic models. We can't, I can't at least, conceptualize the totality of the information that goes into a weather system, right? In here, in our little toy example, these colored colored lines, we have basically a movement of a particle in two dimensions. That's about as much as I can handle. Maybe three. Once we get to four dimensions, I'm out. <laughs> we'll have to ask Alan more about that. <laughs> My tiny monkey brain cannot deal with the position, temperature, and velocity of every atom in the atmosphere. I'm sorry. I'm not that good. <laughs> We're going to look at a couple of examples of chaotic systems. The first, in some relatively fine detail... The second is basically a handful of pictures because the maths is a bit more complicated and it requires calculus to deal with. I'm not teaching calculus. Stuff that. So the first one we are going to look at is called a logistic map, which is a simple model for population dynamics. It looks at the number of, popula of individuals alive at any given time or the way we're going to do it, a proportion of some maximum value that would be alive. So we're going to look at numbers between zero and one. Importantly, yeah. this runs in discrete time, which means we look at time point one, then time point two, then time point three. That sort of pattern, as opposed to continuous time, which does require calculus, annoyingly. So discrete time, does that mean it's like limited over a particular point? Is that what it means? You can run this system to an infinite number of time points. It's just that you only have to iterate. You, you, you can have a function that tells you at discrete time points, so like time point one to time point two to time point three. I'll show you the, f the function for this in just a second. But when it comes to like an ecological interpretation, you can think of this as measuring the size of a population every year. So the same time every year, you just go and measure the population size. Yeah. Some species behave in a way which makes this reasonable if they have very strict seasonal reproduction periods. So you can say, well, I know that this species has a sudden spring reproduction period and then dies off and leaves seeds behind or eggs behind or whatever to reproduce the next year. Insect species do this, um, like even cicadas, although their, their, cycle, their life cycle is a little longer because they have like a se seven year incubation period underground. So there are some species where this discrete time behavior is a reasonable approximation of the actual continuous time that we experience. Wouldn't be nice to just be horny like once a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for people with periods, it would be fucking nice to only have to deal with that once a year too, I imagine. <laughs> the function describes the population size at one time point based on the population size at the previous time point. And we write this as such. We get the population size X at time N plus one is equal to some number r, which we're going to talk about in a second, times the population size at the current time point, xn. I've got times there is one form of x and x here as a different form of x, right? Hopefully those are noticeably different. And we multiply that again by 1 minus xn. So notice we're also going to say that x, x is somewhere in like the interval zero one, right? So we're going to bound it there because uh, with the parameters we're looking at, this isn't going to go outside that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to put this little symbol here means X is in this interval. This relationship here is what's really interesting because as XN approaches one, this number gets bigger, but this gets smaller. So you have this like balancing act between xn being large and 1 minus xn being small. At x is equal to 0 0.5, you get 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 here. Yeah. So why is that multiplied? Um, because that's what the function does. Is the, Yeah, we'll see what how this behaves in just a second. But we multiply these because that's what give us, gives us the behavior that we want. Right. Yeah, if you add them, you get different behavior. Now, let's eyeball this and have a bit of a think. If xn is zero, it's going to stay zero, right? Because zero multiplied by anything is still zero. If xn is one, one minus xn is going to be zero. So you, 
this is bounded between zero and one in that sense. If you hit zero, you stay there. If you hit one, you go to zero and you stay there. You can think of these as representing a situation on the one hand, if xn is zero, where everything is dead. And if xn is one, maybe that's enough population to just eat all of the resources that are available and it dies out the next season. There are some ways to justify those extremes as well. Right. Now let's talk about R. R in this function is the reproduction rate, which represents like births minus deaths basically as a proportion. Uh, you can think of this as like population growth as a proportion of the existing size, right? This yeah. is what governs the long-term behavior of the population size and also whether or not the behavior is chaotic. We're going to bound R in the interval zero to four because that's yeah. where most of the interesting behavior we inter are looking at is. And if you get above four, you actually tend to have stuff explode, the, the actual population size explode out of the zero one interval. Yeah. Before we get into an intense discussion about what happens based on the R value, let's step through a calculation to see how this works. We're going to start at X zero, which is the zero time point, And we're going to say that that will be 0 0.5. Our reproduction rate is going to be 1.2. Our next time step, x1, is equal to r, which is 1.2, times x0, which is 0 0.5, times 1, sorry, I should put that in there, times 1 minus 0 0.5, which is 0 0.3. So this becomes the value that we input into the next iteration. So if yep. we want x2, R stays the same, 1.2, but this time we put this value in rather than the 0 0.5. 0. Point, that's, that's not a zero test. 0. <laughs> 0.3 times 1 minus 0. 0.3, which gives us 0. 0.252. If we want x3, we do this again with 0. 0.252 in place of 0. 0.3, and so on. Yeah. Um, I still don't understand why u times the what the function of the brackets is. Okay, so um, because I have multiplication here, yeah, and I have a, a like subtraction here. If I didn't have the brackets there, this would be r times x n times one minus x n. Oh right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The parent the parentheses mean that you do the the subtraction first. Yeah. Okay, now let's talk about what happens with R. If R is less than or equal to one, so that is basically between zero and one, the population decreases to zero at varying speeds, slower if R is close to one. So we get population goes to zero, basically it dies out. So the way you can think of this is that R is not big enough here to actually replace the people who die. Particularly if R is less than one, you're just having decreasing population size every time and you'll die out. Yeah. The interesting behavior, and what really surprised me when I was first saw this in first year maths, is what happens above one. Because we're going to see a huge and quite surprising range of different behaviors. So for R between one and two, so this means R, so I should write that slightly differently. So R, so one less than R, less than or equal to two, and because, sorry, I've been think I've been writing code, uh, which means that I haven't <laughs> been writing my mathematical symbols properly. This should be less than or equal to. That's what that symbol means. Yeah. So in this range, the population will eventually approach a long-term steady state of R minus one divided by R. What a steady state means is that once you get there, the population size doesn't change over time. It just, you get the same number back every time. Yep. If we think about our r equals 1.2 situation, then we get that x eventually converges to, uh, this is the equal to, but just let's pretend they're talking about convergence, 1.2 minus 1 divided by 1.2, which is equal to 1.6666, so 1.6 repeater. Yeah. We actually saw something like that. So if we go back up to here, this is dropping. We got from, we start at 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 
0.25, it's declining, but the rate at which it's declining is slowing down. So what you typically see if you plot this behavior is uh, if you start above the, asm the uh, steady state, you'll get a decline to this steady state, whatever value it is. If you start below, you'll see an increase until you hit the steady state. So long as you don't start at one or zero. This decline to or increase to, notice those are very smooth, sedate ways of going, right? And, and if you have something that is uh, approaching that slower, what that means is it starts here, but you know it takes longer to get there, basically. That's what it, I meant when I said that the rate of convergence changes based yeah. on what R is. Yep. Between two and three, so two less than or equal to R less than or equal to three, Oh, sorry, this should be just less than. If we've got uh, less than or equal to here, that means two is included in this bit. So yeah. we need to exclude it here. You get similar behavior in that you still have the population approach a steady state, but it will oscillate around the limit for a while before uh, smoothing out. And the closer to three, the longer the period of oscillation. So approach a steady state. What that looks like, if here is our steady state, let's say we go up and then we wiggle around it for a little while, but the wiggles eventually get smaller until we come to the steady state. This may be you start lower or you can start higher and come down and still you wiggle around it, right? As you get R uh, closer and closer to three, the wiggles get longer and bigger. Yep. So is there necessarily a steady state? We'll get to that. This is one of the reasons why this is so interesting. But already here, we have seen different behavior, right? We've seen something that does not change the direction it's going. Like this is going up, at no point does it go down. This is going down, at no point does it go up. All of a sudden, this changes direction. It goes up, then down, up, down, up, down, up, down. These are different behaviors. Yeah. And one thing to notice is that uh, these single steady state. So all of these have a single steady state. It just happens that in the case of R less than or equal to one, that steady state is zero. And so we've got like a, between zero and three have one steady state. Now let's talk about a slightly different situation. So for R less uh, greater than three and less than or equal to uh, approximately 3.44 nine, four, nine, you don't get convergence to a single steady state. Instead, you have two. You get a periodic solution. I-O-D-I-C solution. What that means is, let's say, all of a sudden I have two steady states. Right? So maybe I start here, and I increase, I decrease, I increase, and I decrease, and I just stay oscillating between those two values forever. This is radically different. We all of a sudden don't have a single solution. We have two that happen over an extended period of time. How I think about this is that you have a population that's reproducing fast enough at a low year that at the next year it has too many people or too many uh, entities to survive on the resources, right? So if you start down at this point, you're not using up all the resources in your available area. So the next year you produce more children or and fewer people die. So suddenly you're exceeding the amount of resources in your area and you have people uh, like entities dying off and you drop back down again. And you see this oscillation behavior. This would be unlikely in human populations, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> We, well, our, our reproduction is not well defined like this. We don't have discrete time reproduction. Like, humans are fertile all year round. Yeah. No, sorry, I was just asking because you were saying people. <laughs> well, I, look, animals are kind of like people, right? <laughs> I have a cat, I know that's a person. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between the low and high population sizes gets bigger as R increases, right? As R gets close to that 3.4494. Would you like to guess what happens at that point? Is above that when it starts, um, is when it gets closer to decline by a large, by large rise, if you know what I mean? 
Oh, well, you already see that a bit, like, here. Yeah. Like, this is a decline. I- I'm not going to push you on this because you have no information <laughs> to go off, right? Yeah. So we're going to say for 3.44949, less than R, I'm going to leave this next bit blank for a second. You get four steady states instead of two. Ah. Yeah. So the this persists until roughly 3.54409. Notice that these intervals are getting smaller, right? We had like zero to three had one steady state. Two steady states is like half of 0.44. Yeah. Three, uh, four steady states is a much smaller interval. Yeah, it's like 10%. Oh, well, these aren't percentages, but it's 0.1. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, don't worry about it. We've doubled, and, and this is actually called a period doubling cascade, right? So we've got four periods, period four solution, which tends to look like um, you start here, you go up here, you go down here, you go down here, you go back to the start, right? So this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. So this is periodic. This is a pattern that repeats, but it's very different to the two periods. And interestingly, at this point, at uh, 3.5, four, four, well, my hands are getting shocking. Oh, four, oh, nine, right? It's an R less than blah, blah, blah. You get eight periods then 16, then 32, then 64. This is called the period doubling cascade because it doubles the number of uh, regular solutions for every yeah. little bit. And uh, this doesn't last forever as well. At R approximately, that's what this means, 3.56995, we actually get chaotic behavior which means, quite specifically, that you never see exactly the same solution twice, exactly the same population size twice. Right. Yeah, so because it's a deterministic system, as soon as you saw the same population size, you would get a cycle and you would get a periodic behaviour. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you a diagram about this, but what I want to say is that at this point, once you have these chaotic behaviours, your initial population size matters. You will still have your population stay on that 0, 1 interval, but at any given time, you will not be able to predict the actual size of the population unless you know exactly where you started. Yeah. Now, let's talk about that diagram, because there are a few exceptions. So this is from the Wikipedia article on the logistic map. Thank you very much to the Wikipedia people. How you read this is that you have your R value on this X axis, you have your long term steady states on your Y axis, so this is X. And yeah. if you draw a vertical line above a value, let's say we're drawing it above 2.6, pretend that's straight, <laughs> mm-hmm. where you intersect this gray line tells you how many steady state solutions you have and what value they are. So this would be approximately 0.6 because I can't draw a straight line to save my life at the moment. And there would be one, right? If we come over to here above like 3.2, suddenly we have those two solutions and the yeah. y-axis value tells us where they are. Here is that point where we transition from two steady states to four, yeah. to eight, to 16, and so on, so on, so on, right? You can see the mess of stuff that happens beyond this point. But yeah. every single uh, power of 2, which is what that 2, 4, 8, 16 thing is, is represented in here. In yeah. fact, every natural number is at some point. We can see the chaotic behavior in these gray bits, but at this resolution we can't see where that becomes less chaotic. But if yeah. you look just here, you've got 1 two, three, all of a sudden. So you've gone from powers of two, suddenly you've got three solutions, which is not a power of two. I'm just going to put that out there. 
<laughs> we call these islands of stability. You can think of them as values of R where some of these other states have kind of collapsed together, right? So suddenly you get overlap here. What is interesting about this, at least that I think is interesting, is that you get another doubling cascade because each of these then bifurcates. You can see here you've got, it's very difficult to see, but here you've got this one splits into two and then each of those splits into two. But the same thing's happened here. This one has split into two and this one has split into two. So suddenly this goes three, six, 12, 24, so on. So you've got all of those multiples of three in there as well. This is how we get those um, natural numbers showing up. I think, let's have a look. Nah, not quite. I can't, I, I can't easily spot where the other ones are. You'll just kind of have to take my word for it. Yeah. But this looks like it might be five, like one, two, three, four, five, I think might be about there. So you do have every single number represented here. I'm going to take a second to distinguish between a large number of steady states and a chaotic population size. This comes back to what I said about as soon as in a deterministic system, as soon as you get back to the same number, it will repeat itself. If you have, say, 300 steady states, then cycling them will be re regular, right? Come back in 300 years and you'll have the system behaving the same way again. A chaotic yeah. system will never have that consistent behavior. We call it a periodicity. Behavior without periods, behavior without repetition. This is also where the theoretical maths behavior runs into the real world if we try to apply this to an actual population. Species don't have a fixed reproduction rate. Their environment contributes significantly to what the reproduction rate is at any given time. Yeah. So you can't assume that your species is going to have a fixed reproduction rate, even if their growth is actually described by this function. So even though the model is built around being deterministic, it's not actually deterministic? Well, no, this model is deterministic. The real world is far more complex than this model. It can right. also be deterministic. It's just that at some point, in order to actually compute something, you need a model that is simpler than the real world. Right. Then you have to make an argument for how well your model fits the real world, which can be really quite difficult. <laughs> this, this logistic growth model is not particularly good, but it's mathematically interesting. Yeah. It's also a way to talk about chaotic behavior to people who know nothing about uh, calculus, which is advantageous. So the environment system, the environment a species lives in is also not constant, but itself changing over time. We also have individuals within species, not a continuous proportion. So we can't really expect to never see the same population size again. So if you have like up to 5,000 species, uh, up to 5,000 individuals in a species in a certain area, right? Even if your population can be represented by it like this, at some point, there's only 5,000 options there, right? Between one and 5,000 individuals. So at some point, you're going to have to repeat yourself. Yeah. Because of the environmental changes and the species changes, we don't expect exactly the same population size to follow the same every time because the, env the, the whole system, the whole state of the system is not the same. So even if we have a return to a previous size, say we see 1,000 individuals one year and we come back to that same, uh, same number in the future, we can't predict what's going to happen from there. This does not mean it's not deterministic, it just means that this model is too simple. Yeah. There's also a question of what you can observe. If you take a species uh, out in the wild, shall we say, and you want to model it use sizing, using a logistic map, you don't know how big the population is, which is our starting size x0, and you don't know the true replication rate, r. So you'll never get a perfect measurement of either of these things. So even if the population you're looking at really does follow a logistic growth system, you're going to struggle to map what you observe to that. This is compounded by potentially only observing a fraction of a genuinely periodic behavior. If your system has period 30, and you observe it for five minutes at a time with some gap between those, which doesn't easily map into 30, then you may have to observe the system for centuries in order to see a repeat of the same behavior. Yep. Our next layer of complexity is we're going to move away from discrete time, because you can also see chaotic behavior in continuous time, planetary orbits, weather systems, some of these. Also, fluid dynamics at a certain rate becomes extremely chaotic. Planetary orbits uh, diverge over centuries, 
unlike weather, which is a matter of days. So you can look at how fast your system diverges as well. I am going to show you a couple of pictures for a system in continuous time known as the Lorentz map or the Lorentz attractor. I'm not going to show you the maths. This is one of those ones based on calculus. Instead, I'm going to say that this is a, this is a system which depends on three parameters. The logistic uh, map depends on just one, this R, and represents the motion of a particle in three-dimensional space. Like the logistic map, there are certain parameters that exhibit chaotic behavior. So we're going to pick a, uh, a set of parameters, those three parameters which do, and I'm going to show you these. Now, this first figure, your starting point is x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1, z is equal to 1. And this is a th like a three-dimensional map, uh, a three-dimensional diagram projected down onto two dimensions. So you're starting here, and you kind of spin around. I believe that this starts in here and kind of goes around for a while and then comes back around to here and goes... You get this kind of butterfly behavior, right? Yeah. And if we increase or change the starting point just a little bit, so this goes to 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, we can see that we have a different behavior. You still got these kind of two wings and you still have these like regions that they are cycling around, but the actual state of the system at a given point is different. The parameter values are exactly the same. Is it significant that it seems to get tighter with each up upping of value? Sorry, I was just checking that these are actually on the same scale. So like this distance <laughs> is the same as this distance. So it depends on what you want to do with it, right? Your precise location of your point in time changes, right? So this one, it's hard to tell at this resolution, but this one seems to spend more time around this region than around this region, right? So if you go and observe it at any given point in time, you're more likely to see it here. Whereas this yeah. one looks to be roughly 50-50. So in, in that sense, you get similar like macro scale behavior. You have these two sort of wings and you have the, the point kind of circling each of them. But on the micro scale and the precise location, radically different behavior. Yeah. This is a bit like in our Lorentz map where we have on the macro scale, your population size is still bounded between zero and one. But on the micro scale, it could be anywhere in there, depending on the parameters and your starting point. Yeah. Now we've uh, changed the axis. And so uh, this looks like it goes up slightly further. And our starting point is now 10, 10, 10. And now we actually get more on this side than on the other side. We still have these two kind of wings, but it's the distribution of how long you spend around each has changed. And if we blow way out, we're starting here. First thing we do is cycle in, right? And then you still have these two wings, but you get some different behavior once you get in there. And now it looks like much more of the time is spent on this side again. Yeah. So this is like, I'm talking from very broad brush about here because I don't really want to talk about the mathematical detail. Of course. Please spare me it. <laughs> but when it comes to things like planetary orbits you get exactly the same behavior like we don't know where pluto is going to be in 3000 years in terms of its orbit around the sun we can yeah. probably predict where it's going to be in 500 and as soon as you get what's called a three body problem so you have say three planets three stars two stars one planet some configuration of like masses in space their orbits become very difficult to predict and in a lot of cases chaotic in the sense that they may not have steady states or they may not be predictable so if you ever want to see a very interesting like animation of a chaotic system you can look up something like um, planetary orbits a three-body system or a double pendulum so a double pendulum is instead of just having like one thing that goes back and forth it swings back and forth from a fixed point, you have another one attached to the end. So it's double in the sense that you have two pivot points. This behaves chaotically <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden. And if you add another one, so you have a triple pendulum, it behaves even more chaotically. 
there are some like really fun illustrations of this because you can get some wild behavior and also kind of a cool little desktop toy if you're nerdy enough. So these are a our chaotic and probabilistic system types. There is some evidence that there are actually probabilistic systems, uh, not at the macro scale because we don't have evidence of non-probabilistic behavior at the macro scale, but quantum systems appear to be genuinely probabilistic. It's not clear because we don't actually have a really great understanding of what quantum means or represents or we, the, the results of, outcome, of experiments are extremely consistent, but we have no idea how to interpret that or take those outcomes to larger scales. So is, if that's, is that why you say free will is unlikely? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that we have a very good illusion of it, but and certainly I don't think we can live acting as though we don't have free will because that's not how we experience the world. But certainly I am not convinced that there's any evidence of it being like a physical reality in the sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the illusion is good enough that I don't care. So. <laughs> well, I would take, uh, this is some quasi philosophical bullshit, but I would take. As opposed to everything we've spoken about so far, but go on. <laughs> Uh, I would take the uh, the kind of dialectical approach of both it's true and untrue that free will exists because you are determined by your uh, you are every decision you make is determined by your um, uh, positioning and environment, but at the same time you have some level of uh, responsibility over your uh, over your actions. Well, so, I would argue example, that we experience a sense of responsibility, which is part of the illusion of free will. I well, don't I think say, we could do otherwise. The example I always use is that the laws of capitalism dictated that imperialism was inevitable in the 1800s, but that still doesn't mean that the Victorian era ruling class of Europe was not the, were not the greatest mass murderers in history. Yeah. Both of those things are true at once. Yeah, for sure. And, and this is what I mean by the the illusion is good enough that we could not experience it any other way, right? We have a very real experience of things like guilt or a sense of responsibility and obligation or a sense of justice. And just as huh, just as we could not potentially, as far as I can tell, have done things differently, have made different choices, we also could not avoid feeling the sense of justice and the sense that like somebody who has done something wrong should have consequences or have to restore what they did wrong. Both both sides of that can be deterministic. It's just that because we our consciousness and our experience of the world is emergent behavior, right? It's just too complex to think about in deterministic terms because we don't understand it like that and we don't experience it like that. Yeah. What we experience doesn't have to correspond to physical reality. It's just that what we experience may not be true, in quotation marks, in the terms of, like, there have been... There, have, the, 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 there having been another way to do anything. Yeah. So I was saying that we have, like, these chaotic and these probabilistic systems, right? At the macro scale, I don't actually expect anything to be genuinely probabilistic, but we don't understand how quantum mechanics relates to the macro scale very well. What that means is the sensitivity to initial conditions, right? How well we can measure the world really matters if we're going to try and model anything. This is where statistics and probability can actually be used to bridge the gap between imperfect measurement and what is observed in a deterministic system. In fact, a probabilistic model can be very good at anticipating behavior of a chaotic system if we incorporate a model for measurement error of initial conditions and parameters, potentially. If we go all the way back to that very first sketch. So imagine we have this same starting point position in this red, right? Yep. Measurement error means we actually measure something in the blue, but we say, I know I have measurement error. So what I'm going to do is model everything around blue. So maybe I model something starting over here to our red and then see where it goes from there. So let's imagine that at this point over here, we come out, come over here, right? So I project forward to this second measurement time point. So I have modeled my average case based on what I actually observed. So as I'm out here, my 
most extreme to the left case says I'm out about here. My most extreme to the right case, which let's pretend that's the true value, but it probably would be some margin of error around that, says I'm out here. So my prediction would be, okay, at my next time point, I'm going to be somewhere in this interval here, right? Yeah. That's, that's not a bad way to go. Once I get to that second time interval, I can make another measurement, which will probably be like somewhere in this region. Do the same thing, project an interval forward, and so on. This is kind of what we do with a lot of um, actual modeling. So you will have your average case, your worst case, and your best case scenario. I think climate change models, for example. We're projecting into the unknown with huge amounts of error because we don't have like a huge understanding of what those systems will be, and the system is chaotic. But we can say, worst case scenario, these are the sorts of qualitative behaviors we will expect to see. Like, we expect to see these broad scale changes in climate. We expect to see the frequency of large fires or storms increase some amount. We don't know how much, but we can put error margins around that. This lets us get an idea of what's happening, even if it does, even if it's not all that precise. You're not trying to predict the weather in 50 years time on one particular day based on two degrees of warming, right? You're saying, broad brush, what characteristics do we see in a chaotic system when we change these factors? Yeah. And that's based on a probabilistic model, really, because you have a probabilistic model for the error. In this context, probability doesn't represent true randomness in a mathematical sense. It represents error, uncertainty, and ignorance, it, our lack of knowledge. And in many respects, I find this to be a much more useful and much more powerful understanding of statistics and probability applied to the real world than pure mathematical randomness. So when I am talking about probabilistic stuff, when we go back and do other stats things, that's the sort of mindset I take to it. And I try to teach all my students about this. But if you think back to when we talked about like our Bayesian versus frequentist approaches to statistics, that's a very Bayesian attitude. Because in Bayesian statistics, you more or less explicitly model your ignorance as a probabilistic system. Right. Yeah, I really like that. I think it's quite powerful. And that is everything for today. Got any questions? No, I think I understand. understood that. It was, um, it was really fascinating too. Yeah, I, so this logistic model was basically the first time I encountered a mathematical system that had what is a relatively simple formulation, right? You got some multiplication yeah. there, you got some subtraction, and you iterate. That's it. But you have such radically different behaviors. Like, what, what, the, what I saw, the assignment that I got in this, actually had us plot long-term behavior for different values of R. So we started out looking at these values that have this, like, converging to a single steady state. And we said, yeah. all right, that looks reasonable. And then we saw this, and I went, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and then we saw this, and I went, what the fuck? <laughs> like, no joke, because it never occurred to me that as simple a function as that could produce this sort of dynamic behavior. Yeah. I, I just hadn't, I had never seen it before. It had never occurred to me that it could. And that really got me hooked in many respects on what you can do with these kind of systems. And as you go further into maths, you see wildly more chaotic stuff like the Lorentz attractor or whatever else. But I really like this. It's one of my favorite mathematical objects, precisely because even with this one parameter, it shows you so many different things. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll talk to you next time. Speak to you then.